What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Mark Gascoigne of Trampoline Branding. And Mark, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast uh, before I formally introduce you. And, you know, since this is part of the Top Agency series, um, some of the fan favorites, uh, I did one with Todd Tasky. He um, has actually a podcast called The Second Bite Podcast. He pairs private equity with agencies and he helps sell agencies and he calls it the second bite because some of the founders that he works with they make more on the second bite than they do on the first um because the private equity sells again and the owner uh rolls in equity into that and it's interesting because he talked about valuations selling agencies and everything like that i also did one a fan favor in the agency one is jason swank he built his agency to over eight figures and sold it. And then he's been buying up agencies. And he also talks about kind of the valuations and what he's seeing and and his experience in the industry. So those are really interesting episodes, that and many more on InspiredInsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. You know, Mark, we call ourselves kind of the magic elves that are working in the background, running around, making it look easy for the host and the company so they could just do the show and build relationships and run their business. So, you know, for me, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to buy my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people in companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Mark Gascoigne. He is CEO and founder of Trampoline Branding. Uh, There are over 24 people. And he actually took his first agency job. Is it, Mark, I don't want to age you, but as uh, account executive in Vancouver over 30 years ago. And um, I know like there was a certain point you're like, you are going to get out before a certain age, but I guess you're just loving it too much and you're still going. He describes himself, at least on his website, I love his description, Mark, is he's been an ad guy long enough to know a good ad, but too long to make one himself. So, which which will go into the conversation of succession. But Mark, thanks for joining me. Yeah, Jeremy, great. Great to be here. Talk about just trampoline branding uh, for a second of what you do. And I'm going to, I'll pull up the website here. Cause I, I love uh, the branding, even like the um, you know, your logo and the, the red. So obviously this is what you do, but talk about what services you offer and what you do. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, just a couple of, of uh, comments on your, on your intro. It's actually not over 30 years. It's exactly 30 years. <laughs> Um, well, someone may listen and, to this next year, so then it'll be over 30 years. So, And the the other thing I would say is that, you know, advertising is something that's very trendy. So when you think about trends, you think about things that are trendy, they tend to be created and promoted by youth. And so, you know, I, I think it is a young business. I recognize that early. And what what I think what you're referring to is when I quoted I wanted to be out of the business by the time I was 50, so I failed that one. But what what I did know is that there's a people around here, a lot more smarter people, younger people, more in tune with what's going on, that are much better at creating the ads themselves. So we have teams of copywriters and art directors and web developers and strategists that work on that stuff. Um, but we also, so we distinguish between advertising and branding. So if advertising is kind of the episodes that are happening on a frequent basis and are a bit more trendy, branding, we feel as more permanent. So those are the, that's, that's the residue from the advertising and that's what accumulates over time and creates the brand, creates what, what a company and what a brand stands for. And so that's, that's kind of a little bit of a distinguishing between the advertising and branding. 
what type of clients do you tend to work with? Um, we're, a, you know, we're in a small market here. So we've chosen not to have uh, a single specialty. Having said that, uh, we do a lot of government work. We were the agency that worked on all of the COVID related things that some of them you're flicking through now. Um, education has been a long standing area working with one of the local universities plus some of the uh, university associations. Um, tourism is an area that we've worked with just about every DMO, a destination marketing organization, the provinces, the cities, the regions, and we'll continue to do so. And then, you know, whatever, the other thing that we tend to pride ourselves on is recognizing who the good clients are in the region. And when I say clients, I use clients as the individuals. So people that do believe in full service agencies and do believe that good creative can help their businesses grow. Those are the people that we we follow when they go to new places and they seem to tap us uh, when they land there. Yeah, I want to talk about some milestones, um, but but first, I notice right here on this table top is Ogilvy on advertising. So I'd love to hear some of your influences, um, whether it's book or mentor um, in, in the industry. Yeah, um, it's, you know, it, it, it's a little bit staged that and I'm glad you picked up on that. So it's it's the notion that, you know, if you look at all of our work, we're very much a modern agency and very digitally focused in in the media and in the creative that we create. But it it's you know, it's that old adage that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And, uh, you know, I Every young person that comes here, I say, hey, listen, spend 20 minutes and flip to this book because you'd be amazed with how things it's timeless. And it is timeless for sure. I mean, I geek out on res direct response, copywriting and things like that. Are there any other books that you recommend people check out in in this branding, advertising, you know, copywriting world? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I, Adam Grant's uh, book from last year is, is I think it's an unbelievable book. Mm. Um, I haven't so. checked it out. I I, I uh, listened to Give and Take, but not his newest one. His book from a couple of years ago is, um, oh shoot, um, it's about change. <laughs> it's basically it's basically about uh, you know how uh, ch changing your mind or something like that. That's a great book. So I just think it's it's a very it's a very good. Think again, is it? Is that think the one? again? Think again. That's okay. A, yeah. So he's got a uh, give and take, and it looks like originals. I didn't even know he had this hidden potential book. I think that's him. And then think again is the newest one you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. That's a great book. Um, besides Ogilvy on advertising. The um, Love Mark, um, a book from years ago. I, I tend to like the older books, but I, I, I Love also Love Mark. What's that? Love Mark. It's uh, it's a book by written by a guy who used to run TBWA out of Paris, mm -hmm. and it, it's just it's again back to my point about advertising being what you do in the moment, both campaigns, the trendiness, freshness, and then it it building brands, building love marks, trademarks. And um, so it's a, it's a very good book for that kind of stuff. That's great. I'll check that out. Not heard of that one. Um, let's talk about milestones. Um, I know we are talking, you know, there's, you know, pre COVID it's like, I don't know why it's, it's marked by COVID at this point, but, uh, but yeah, it's uh, pre COVID during and then after, but what about a milestone when you first started, you know, right now you get larger clients, um, what was a milestone when you first started of how you got one of your first, you know, key clients? Um, there's, there's been a few, uh, actually my most visceral milestone, I would say is actually not getting a client, but it was after a few years. And, you know, when you're, when you're running an agency, especially, you know, start a small agency and a mom and pop type, literally we were because husband and wife, founded and and ran it for so long um my partner leslie and um so you know we tended to touch everything when we were a dozen people and i remember when we got to a size where 
the first time I saw what I would say an ad, what we say in the wild. So, you know, an ad out in the marketplace, a billboard or whatever it was. And I didn't even know we were working on it. And uh, it's kind of that, that would be a, a pretty special moment, sort of that notion that, you know, lots of things can happen without you. And in this case, it happened better, which was awesome. Um, talk about starting the company with your wife. So it, it wasn't done on purpose. Um, as you said before, I started, um, we start. we both basically started our careers in Vancouver. We're from here, but we ended up in Vancouver right after university. And um, when we moved back here, it wasn't our intention to work together, but we were just kind of brought together. I joined uh, what became Trampoline. It was originally called Page and Wood. Um, and then Leslie was working already for another agency and she quickly realized, yeah, this is, I don't want to work anywhere else. And we have a chance to make something that's going to work for both of us. So she came over and then the four of us, two of us became partners with the existing people. And then we changed it to trampoline. And that was in 2004. And then in 2007, we bought out the two partners who were kind of at the age we are now. So it made perfect sense. And now we're in the process. You asked me before about sort of themes, things that are keeping me up at night. Um, succession is is that. And the you you referenced COVID. The past three or four years have kind of um, put a little bit of a damper in that. But we're we're back on that track. Back in two thousand seven, um, you you've went through this play. You you've went through this before the succession, except you were on the other end of it. How how did that process go? Yeah, it was it was good. You know, it was a it was a perfect um perfect storm. They were ready to finish and we were ready to start. So it it's going to serve us well, I think, going forward about what to look for in the succession. So, you know, we're not in a in a desperate hurry. It's not a we're not looking for just um, you know, a really quick exit. We're working for looking for the right one and we're lucky enough to have a really good executive now that can basically run the show so it it could be the form of um you know employee buyout or we could be shareholders for a little bit longer or someone could come in and um emerge so we're we're just you know we're just open right now to various scenarios what when you look back in 2007 what would you do the same now going this time around for you and what would you do differently Uh, what I would do differently is they were done quickly. So we bought them and then they basically left soon after, perhaps maybe too soon after. So in our case, we're you know willing and able to um, to stick around a little longer. So that would be the differently. Um, the same the same would be to put it in the hands of some people that are really ready to run with it, you know, not hang on to it. So even if we're still around, still have influence, still have equity, whatever, definitely just give the steering wheel to somebody else. And, you know, you can't both have your hands on it. So. I mean, you've been through this before. Let's say someone's listening, Mark, and they're wondering, yeah, like I haven't even, I, now that you mention it, I should be thinking about it, but I haven't. And you've been thinking a lot about it. Um, what are the steps that someone should think about? Like in the first step, uh, for in the first time in 2007, do you first go and get an external evaluation? Like what are some of the steps you put in place so that, you know, you come to something agreeable between two parties? Because I find, at least in some of the conversations I've had, some people value it in their mind more than maybe it's valued in the market. And there's a lot of, you know, it's someone's baby, right? So there's some emotion tied to that as well. So what are some of the steps yeah. you put you did when you um you actually did that transaction in 2007? For sure. Yeah, it's like anything else. It's um it's usually of the most value to the person that's the closest to it. Um so and as you move further away, it's less and less valuable. So the first one is um less C and I. So, you know, we're aligned on 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 everything and, and with that regard, sort of timing and what would what that would look like. And then also the senior people that are here. So they're totally aware of what's going on and um, may or may not be part of that 
sort of equity transfer. So, I mean, you know, I think those are the two main things is the, the alignment piece to make sure that everybody that's, everyone that's close to it is aware and there's no secrets. It's not done behind closed doors and because, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't serve anybody. Were there service professionals that you brought on like externally to uh, evaluate the, you know, the company or how did you, who who did you bring in externally to help with the process? We're pretty lucky that we've had the same accounting firm for several years. They've seen us through the, you know, the ups and the downs. Um, we have a sort of a strategic business advisor, the same thing that, that helps us. And, you know, and also we're part of a network across Canada called TCAN, which um, is the Trans Canada Advertising Network. And so, you know, we have a peer group that we get to talk to formally and informally. And a lot of them are at the same stage of with their businesses. So, you know, we, we there's a there's a lot of a lot of sharing of information and and best practices and experiences. So that's been very helpful. Yeah. What what did you see back then? And what do you see? I don't know if you see differences now with um how the agency is valued based on multiples of EBITDA what were you seeing you know ranges um then versus now um you know i well we've just said we've had such fluctuations in the past 3 4 years that um i i think people are looking more to the future than the past you know so just because you did have a really good past and, uh, you know, those multiples don't necessarily inform the future and vice versa. If you've had a, a, a tough few years, it's not as, as big a deal. I think it's a little easier to kind of look for it. And in a, the agency world, as you know, it's not like we don't sell insurance. We don't we don't have these things. Uh, you know, we don't have a book of business that is that's not going anywhere. Um, so much of it is just dependent on the people there so now luckily for an agency like us we've been there long enough and it has a track record and and a um an awareness in the marketplace that we we tend to you know get our fair share of of stuff so but i would say i would say that's it i think it's more about the optimism and how you're trending as opposed and how you're trending forward as opposed to how you've done over the past 10 years Right. They're looking at the past like a couple of years and like you're trending in a certain direction for revenue. And then have you seen what have you seen as ranges of um multiples for for sale of agencies? I think agencies are probably somewhere in sort of five to five, six percent, five, five, six times. You know, it's not ten times, it's not like um you know, subscription service businesses that, um, or financial businesses like that. I think it's it's probably more in that, that range. Yeah, no, like a SaaS company. Um, what about you know? You mentioned obviously you started this with your wife. What were the different skill sets that you brought to the table? Each of you brought to the table, and how do you divide responsibilities? It kind of we both were what we call suits. You know, we're both uh, client service strategy side of the business. Um, she t- she tends to be much better at, at process and um, sort of the working, you know, on the projects. And I tend to be better on the sort of strategy um, um, and, and coordinating sort of taking strategy into creative side of it. So it, it's kind of worked well and we split up the clients that way. And, and now I don't really work on any clients. It's, it's only the that and the, and the BD side of it. So it, we naturally had different strengths and didn't trip over each other too much in the beginning. <laughs> um, so yeah, it kind of worked out. What were some of the key hires you made? Like you said, you started off smaller. Um, now you have a bigger team. What were some of the key hires along the way um, and how you grew? Yeah, we, um, I'd say, you know, when we joined, it was a creative only shop. You know, we uh, were creative in design and now we're full service. So we early on in the in the, you know, 2000, the knots, I guess they are late knots. Um, 
created a web department. So we've had a web department probably since 2006, seven. So it's coming on 15 years. Um, soon after that, a media department. Um, and so those would be, and we've continued to, um, to uh, sort of improve higher up each time, get better quality uh, media directors, web people, um, and probably the latest one is um, we've we now have a creative director who is he came from another agency um, by way of he was at another agency then he was a client of ours and then we drew him back into the business and um, so he's basically a, a partner of ours sort of the the three of us and that's fantastic to have an executive creative director uh, you know it's it's an agency that at the end of the day that's the commodity that we have that is of most value that our clients really can't do for themselves is the actual creative. I mean, they can, they can place media, they can, they can hire a web developer or those things, but the thing that they really aren't able to do is that, that creative piece. And so to have an executive creative director right kind of in the engine room, we think is a real important piece for trampoline. As you expanded uh, Mark, was it because you were just getting demand from the clients for these other services? I'd say it was a combination of that and the um, the recognition that this the quality of the whole campaign is going to be that much more impactful if all the players, you know, the orchestra is all right there in the same pit. You know, they're not in different rooms. And so it was just awkward to have a media shop somewhere else and a, and a web um, group somewhere else. It just, you know, not that it can't be done and not that we don't use outside um, freelancers now, but just on a day to day basis, if you're if they're present, you're going to think about it. So you're gonna, so the web execution online doesn't become an afterthought and and creative isn't done in a vacuum without thinking about what the what the media what's going to be the best media execution for that target and that geography so just having them present ever present we we feel is is um just as is a better quality output you mentioned you know bringing on director and then um it sounds like the director was brought on also as a partner eventually um, how did you structure that? And you don't have to say numbers, but I'm curious on, you know, is there, they have to be there a certain number of years and do they have to buy in? How does that, the structure work to introduce a partner into the business? Um, so at the moment, we don't have any other partners besides Les and I, like uh, oh, gotcha. equity, equity partners, you know, um, and so we're working through that and that, it, that may change over the, the coming months and years. Um, but I think it's it's less longevity and just more, you know, knowing the fit. And back to what I said before, when we were ready, it's um, it's just, you know, your, your station in life and y- your capacity and eagerness to to build something. So you know, that, those would be the. It's some, for some people that might be a few years for some, it might be a few days. I, I don't, I don't think it needs to be a hard and fast uh, kind of apprenticeship into ownership. When I look at your website and the team, one thing that sticks out is um, a director of operations. And I, I figure that is a, a really significant hire. Someone who's overseeing the operations. At what point did you decide we need a director of operations? And I'm I'm curious what exactly you were looking for in that position. Yeah, our um, our director of operations, Larry, he came through the business. He was a designer back in the day, um, and it's you know at the end of the day we're a, we're a production facility. You know we're we're producing stuff, and so. It's um, th- there's a bit of chaos in the in the in the in the conception of it um, and the creation of it, but then it, a lot of moving know, pieces. A lot of moving pieces, but but then it, but then it needs to get it needs to get into production. It needs to move along in a process. It needs because it needs to be packaged up and shipped out at some point. So to have somebody 
that is, you know, not beholden to the client, not beholden to the creative, not beholden to the media, the strategy that's kind of above or beneath all of that. Um, and that happens pretty early. You know, I would say that happened as soon as we went from just being a creative shop and had all the other pieces. So what if someone's looking to hire a director of operations, what are some of the attributes that you have found, um, you know, in, in Larry or anyone that would be paramount to be successful? Um, I would say they, they, it would be a disservice if they were a people pleaser. <laughs> you know, I, I think, I think they have to be sort of, um, agnostic to the players and beholden to the the product, and that's 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 tough. You know, I, I, you know a lot of a lot of times it's just easier to try to please the person in front of you. But yeah, I think I think you need to you need to hold the um, the the thing that's being produced as being the most important, and that'll that'll serve everybody. So you know that would obviously I mean all the things that. They need to be processed. They need to be detailed. I mean, all those things are pretty simple. They're on every job description. But um, I, I think not being afraid of uh, conflict and a little friction. I think that's an important aspect. Like you were saying, Larry started in a, in a different position, and then kind of seems like you recognize that this person's be a good director of operations. What did you see in him? at that point, there's like, he'd be really good at, at this, right? Because there's other people you pro who probably had his job before that maybe wouldn't have been the best director of operations. Yeah, yeah, well, he had done it at another place and uh, he's from Calgary and he moved here to Halifax just for a change about a dozen years ago. And um, I, I remember the day I called him and this was indicative of back to sort of the people pleaser part. I, I called him because we were desperate for somebody and uh, I, I liked the way his resume looked. And he said, oh, yeah, sorry. I asked him if he could come in that afternoon. And he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm painting my deck. And I said, well, what time have you finished? And he said, I don't know, about three. I said, OK, well, how about four? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so he and so he did begrudgingly and it worked out. But you know, right away, I knew it wasn't someone that was just going to kind of tell you what you wanted to hear. <laughs> right. That could be good and bad, I guess. Right. It's like, <laughs> do you really want a job or not? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm offering you something here. Um, so let's talk about the milestones. So some of the pre-COVID and then we can get into during. Where are some of the pre-COVID milestones that stick out to you? Yeah, I mentioned before about seeing an ad in the wild for the first time. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know it was happening. It was a good one. Um, and then. You know, I think a lot of agencies um, become have their first seeming success period when they get a big client. You know, and a big client is a big part of their business, and everyone you know, is screwing around, and everyone's working on that one client, and it becomes, you know, half of their business, and um, the the tail starts to wag the dog, and and I. I think that that is a disservice to both the client and the agency because the reason why a client comes to an agency is for objective thinking and fresh thinking and experiences from other clients and not necessarily otherwise it's just an in-house department. So we went through that exact same thing. We went through that stage where we had one client that was 50% of more of our business. And so I, th I think after... <laughs> It was probably after six or seven years when we finally had no client more than about 20% of our business. That was a real milestone and something that felt felt really good. And and today there's no one that's even close to that. And that's that feels good. So when you have that 50%, what is what are you thinking in your mind? Just we need to hustle and get more clients. This person not more than 50%. Like how, what are you doing? Or what are you communicating with the team at that point? Well, it's it's such a double-edged sword because um, you know that you're beholden to them. So you know that that's a, that's a dangerous position to be in. And you're, you're not big enough that, I mean, everybody's working on it. So there's that. And then 
you know, the everyone's so busy working on it, you don't have time to find other stuff. So it just becomes this this That's cycle. Awful cycle and then also when you do go to try to pitch other business obviously you can't there's conflicts you can't get business in that space because you know it's not like you can say well we can bring on another client and in in the space and you know we'll put up a chinese wall because it's just obvious that, that can't happen at a little agency and so you know it, it looks like all you do is that category because that's all your all your case study has that work and so it's it just makes it difficult for you to be attractive to somebody else. So, yeah, it's because then you get pigeonholed, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, this is what we do. So then, how do you break out of that? How did you eventually go from okay, <clears throat> there's fifty percent now. It's you know only our biggest clients twenty percent, and then not even close yeah. to that. You know what? There was a conscious moment where we um, for, well, for one thing, is we resigned that client. Um, that, that was a tough thing to do. In 2006. And um, so that helped that. <laughs> um, but the other thing, it, it's interesting you say about experience. We looked at categories and realized, you know, retail will be a, is a, an important one. Um, um, professional services are important ones. So, you know, we sort of looked at the categories and we just went and got anyone we could, a small, like retail, we just went and did some work for a small sporting goods store. Now we have the region's biggest mall and, you know, could do, you know, really anything in, in the space. So it was, it's just a matter of kind of laddering, laddering up to it. And it's, and it's almost less about your capability as it is your, um, being able to convince somebody that you could do it. What is the, what is that? What did that sales process look like? Cause you go out and now you've, you're basically going into a different category. How do you reach out? And then eventually you said you built up to get one of the largest sporting goods stores. What is the initial kind of process look like? Yeah, just, just targeting, you know, um, just sort of reaching out, finding out who the people are, um, asking to have a conversation, um, Sometimes, sometimes it can take two or three years before you kind of get a sniff and sometimes you never do, but it's, um, you know, we, we believe that fit is very important. So there's no point, no point in us going after a client that we're not going to be able to do the work for. So, you know, we need to get smart on it. And, and often we, you know, we, we find things that would be of interest to them and, share them with them, send them links to articles we found, um, you know, what, whatever it kind of takes to, uh, to show them that, you know, that it's, it's something that we're interested in and then, you know, have some kind of, um, you know, affinity for, or, or at least we are able to ask the right questions. So just kind of throughout the years, just being as helpful as you can and pointing mm. things out and then, eventually there's a trust that's built sounds like yeah for sure so pre-covid um during covid what sticks out as a milestone yeah well i'll tell you what was really um heartwarming about during covid is i don't know about your own your own sort of buying patterns but it seemed that a lot of us kind of retrenched back to what we, who we trusted, you know, the people weren't changing, you know, if they, if they were buying a, a, a car from a guy before COVID, they went back to that same guy during COVID, you know, or if they, you know, you just pick a category, pick something Pe people tend to, and we found that with agencies. So certainly a lot of um, marketing budgets, got eradicated because they're in a category that nothing's happened if you're in travel or if you're in fast food initially um, or whatever. But if you're in building supplies, you, you know, you couldn't keep the stuff on the shelves, but, but we found that clients that we'd had for a long time certainly didn't leave us. And some clients that may have, you know, recently not, you know, we hadn't been working with came back. And so that was, you know, that felt good. You know, that we were, there wasn't a ton of new business out there, but the stuff that was, they were kind of just saying, okay, you know, you don't have to pitch it. We're good to go. Let's, let's get going. Hmm. And then what about post COVID? Um, it's, 
it's definitely taking a little while to sort of the traction, but I think one one thing that I'm that um we're very optimistic about and happy about, and we've seen from two or three clients that have, you know, over the past 10 years pieced up their work, you know, into all the different so-called specialists, media, creative, web, SCM, SEO, PR, whatever. Um, they are coming back to a full service agency. And if it's, it could be an AOR relationship or at the very least having someone to help quarterback it all, they were just getting exhausted with trying to coordinate all those pieces because so many at, we all did clients, agencies, um, had so much turnover. So that, um, you know, made it difficult for the the clients to even know who those suppliers might have been. And then even within those suppliers, the, some of the pieces changed. So, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing kind of um, a back to the, the old agency days, which is, we're happy about. One of the campaigns that stuck out for me when I was researching is um, get up there. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that was uh, that um, in uh, 2008. My dad died of colon cancer, and so um, a bunch of us uh, were just kind of um, strategizing or kind of shooting the shit about how, what we could do to raise awareness for this. Because we, I didn't know much about it, but I quickly learned that it's you know it's it's a very unique cancer in as much that it takes years to develop and there, there are early warning signs. Some are a little harder to, to find out than others, but you know, it's, it's one of those cancers that um, if detected early, the survival rate is, is amazing. And it really obviously um, concerned me that it's something my dad must've had for years and had it been found a few years sooner, he would have been fine. So we got on a bit of a crusade to for that. And now um, in Nova Scotia, we have a screening program that is, um, we have, obviously we have um, um, public health here and everybody over the age of 50 gets a kit in the mail and it's a simple test that you do and you, you send it in. And if uh, it, it, pretty well 100 percent guarantees that you're not going to get it if you go through the program you know or mm -hmm. it'll, or once it once it's detected then it can be dealt with hopefully at an early stage and so that's something that we have been doing now for 15 years and we'll keep doing forever and then you what are some of the things you do around it i know you um i've seen the videos out there Right. So what kind of media and things are you doing um, for the organization? So it's it's been very much. And, you know, we have a mantra around here that, um, you know, advertising is the last thing we do. And what we mean by that is that it's, you know. The, the, the best the best form of I mean, at the end of the day, sales is everything or change of behavior. And the best way to do that is get in front of someone and talk to them about it and give them a course of action. So obviously you can't do that to everyone and that's why you have advertising. But there are lots of other things in front of that. So over the years, we've had a, a fundraising campaign that's been going, an awareness campaign every March and working with a local hospital and we've raised millions of dollars for that. And so, you know, that's that classic old type of marketing where you get, you know, it's a lot easier to have a hundred tables of 10 and sell a hundred tickets than to go to try sell a thousand tickets. And so, you know, we have a legion of people out there that are now part of get up there who raise funds and awareness. And, um, you know, the, the amount of advertising that's required really is just reaching out to that, to that nation of people. And it's, and it's just ever expanding. Uh, we, we just got a note recently that, so this screening program I was telling you about in Nova Scotia, if you did have a positive test, um, you could have waited as much as six months before you got a colonoscopy. The money that we raised over the past few years has outfitted some colonoscopy suites that are now dedicated strictly to people that have 
that are part of that program. So now the waiting list is two weeks. So if you did the amazing. test, got a positive response, um, you would have a colonoscopy within two weeks. And so that's from the money that we that's great here. So thanks for sharing that. I'm sorry to hear about your dad. And what's what's a lesson you learned from him? Uh, you know, he, he once said to me, because I I'd done a few things um, earlier in my career. I, I was in the ski business. I worked in the resort business. I was uh, I, I liked the marketing side, working for companies. Um, he did say, you know, before you're 40, make sure you're doing something you love to do. So I definitely got involved in advertising before then. So as I said before, I thought I might be out before I'm 50, but it's okay. <laughs> Um, Mark, I have one last question um, before I ask it. Uh, just thanks for sharing your journey. Thanks for sharing your stories. Um, everyone can, ch can check out trampolinebranding.com to learn more. Uh, my last question is just some of the organizations and people that have you know been mentors to you. I know you mentioned TCAN as one. Um, what organizations and people have influenced you in your journey? Um. There's there's a sort of the grandfather of advertising in Canada. His name's Frank Palmer. Uh, he's based in Vancouver. He's been a great mentor over the years. He's got a he's got a couple of books out there. He worked for an agency called um, Palmer Jarvis, and then he was bought out by DDB. And uh, and it's funny he we I, I said we're part of TCAN, which is the it's a a network of independent agencies, although. He has been kind of the chairman um, uh, ceremonially for the past 20 years, even though he, he was, was part of the DDB network because he was he was such an entrepreneur. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, I was talking to someone the other day and he was he was lamenting over the fact that it's so hard to find marketing people in companies uh, for companies. And, you know, he was he was saying that they they tend they tend to be you know islands on their own within the companies and it's hard to integrate them into the companies and what are the what are the are kind of the characteristics you should look for and you know the the good marketers really are generalists because if they're good at something then they're just going to do that thing at the at the expense of everything else but if they're kind of a little bit good at everything then they're going to be much more willing to go and find the best at those things. So um, I think that that agencies are the best when they're, when they're generalists, because we're not going to pretend that we do. We shoot the best TV commercials. Well, no, we don't. We come up with the great ideas, but we will find the production company that will shoot that, or we're not going to, you know, go take the pictures on our own iPhone. We're going to get the best photographer. So you know, I think we, we know back to what I said before, we know what a great ad is, or we know what a great picture is, or we know what a great something is, but it doesn't mean we have to do it. And so that's, uh, that's probably the, the best lesson that I've learned over the years. Mark, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I want to check out more episodes of the podcast, trampolinebranding.com. And Mark, thanks so much. All right, Jeremy. Thank you. What I got. Can't buy. It reflects between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.